All right, hey, what's up, y'all? So I decided to come back to the little studio because I have a very important message <clears throat> for you today. Uh, that sounds really weird. Anyway, <laughs> now I would ask that if you're watching this, this is going to be a... I hate using the word controversial because I don't think people care about, like, I don't think anything I have to say is really that important, but this is going to be somewhat uh, divisive, I think. Um, but I think it's very important. So if you're going to watch this video, please watch to the end. Um, if not, like, that's fine. You know, <laughs> like if you're not willing to commit to it, that's totally fine. There's like a hundred other awesome YouTube videos to watch. Um, but the, what I want to talk about today is um, I watched a documentary last night um, about the FLDS church. So it's about Warren Jeffs and, uh, and about the FLES church. And it, first of all, it freaked me out. If you haven't seen it, and if you don't know who Warren Jeffs is, you should pause the video and go look him up because the rest of this won't make a whole lot of sense until you've had a chance to, to know who he is. Um, but uh, it freaked me out because he had a relationship with his followers. Well, I'll put it to you this way. You ever seen that show... Um, with, uh, oh, what's it called? With Kevin Bacon, where he's following the, uh, the serial killer cult, like the death cult. I forget what it's called. It's really surrounded with Edgar Allan Poe. I think it was on FX. Anyway, this is a terrible introduction to this. But this is, that, that show actually is what kicked off this thought for me. Which was, the, the people that followed that guy, and the people that followed Warren Jeffs, and same thing like with Scientology, the people that follow these, these we'll say charismatic, but these leaders that, lead people to do weird, crazy things. Um, in terms of their relationship with the authority figure, aren't that different from like Mormons or Catholics, right? We, I, I know this to be true, is very common in the Mormon church for deference to be given to what the prophet says or the leadership of the church says over what you feel and hear. It's always, you know, well, once the prophet speaks, that's enough for me. In fact, that's a very, very widely accepted sort of a language pattern to describe their relationship with, you know, with, um, with authority in the church, which scares me. Not because I think that our leadership is even close or even in the same realm as these other guys. Like the, if you, if you've seen the leadership of the Mormon church speak, you know, they are the most, they're, they, they have their faults obviously, but they are the most, I don't know. I, I just think that they're so driven in, in trying to lead good lives um, they're not, I don't see them as, you know, even being in the same league as, uh, as Warren Jeffs for that reason. But anyway, the problem I see is not actually, it's not the leadership itself, but it's in the, the devotion. It's in the over devotion that we have to them as people. We, we put them up on pedestals and make of them gods as though their words cannot be faulty. We, we, they, they can't make mistakes. And it comes from a sort of doctrinal place because we talk about, God will never allow the prophet to lead us astray, right? That's a very common uh, principle and doctrine that we talk about in the church. And we also talk a lot about how, you know, yes, the, the prophets are, are, are men, the 12 apostles are men, but when they speak under the mantle of authority in conference, then there's no mistakes. Well, we know that's not true. We know that's not true because for, for 60 years, they preached the blacks could have the priesthood from, from the pulpit. Now, I, I don't really want to go into like a, a hate bashing session about like the history of the church or any of that kind of stuff, because that's not really the point here. What the, what the people do, what the, the brethren do from the pulpit is, is not relevant for this conversation, because I think that everything that they say from the pulpit mostly is meant to make, to help us to be better people. It's to, meant to help us to learn how to live so that we can be better people and be more by Christ. That's the whole point. Um, the problem is that we, the membership of the church, the people, uh, have no filter. We have no mechanism for approaching God and asking questions and questioning, because we think that questioning makes us apostate. And the, I'm so, so upset because this whole thing with the ordained women and what's her face getting excommunicated and then John Dellen getting excommunicated, it puts a really bad taste in our mouths around the idea of questioning, right? 
because those people were not questioning, they were inciting. Okay, there's a difference between questioning and inciting. Okay, questioning is an internal exercise, right? It's between you, your belief system, God, and whatever is happening in front of you. Okay, inciting is I disagree, and therefore I'm going to make a big deal out of it. Now, in some instances, I will I, I will say that well, in all instances, when there are things that are going on that are shady, there should be no fear amongst anyone of bringing those things to light. There are things that we can't really explain, and they're not really that great. The the Mountain Hills Massacre, whatever it's called, right? Don't really know a whole lot about. Most Mormons don't have any idea what that is. Uh, if a lot of you watching this video are Googling that frantically right now to figure out what that is, right? Not a whole lot of good explanation for that. Blacks in the priesthood, um, gay marriage, all these different types of things um, are are instances where we may not really be able to understand sort of where everything's coming from. But I think the important thing is our, that relationship that we have with with God needs to be the, the primary source of our, um, just of our spiritual sort of foundation. And, and here's the big kicker, and I hope you've stayed, you watched the whole video and you got to this point, because this is really the point that I'm trying to make. Fear is what holds you back from gre- creating that true relationship with spirituality, with God, with Christ. And it's a fear. This is where, this is so, I feel bad saying this, but I don't. Um, I feel bad because I know you're going to misunderstand me. The, the, what happens is we are afraid as a people of getting truly personal revelation. We're afraid of what God is going to tell us. And I don't know why. I, I don't think that we really believe that God can speak to us. We believe he can speak to the prophet. We believe he speaks to the, the quorum of the Twelve, and then he, those people said to tell us. But I don't think we really believe that God can speak to them and us at the same time. And I apologize to all of you non-Mormons that are, I realize now this has gotten very Mormon at this point. So anyway, I don't think we really believe that he can do both at the same time. Because if we did, if we, if we really believe that God can speak to, to the prophet and he can speak to me, we would have trust and faith in the fact that God can say something to the prophet. I can take that, what he said to the prophet, and then was given to me in conference, take it back to God and say, hey, how does this work out? Like, how do, how do I square this with what I feel, with what I feel is right and what I believe, right? And guess what? God will tell us, right? If we really believe that God speaks to us, if we really gave him the credit and realized that he has the capability of speaking to us, if he's there, of course he can speak to us. That's the whole point. He can tell us the same thing. And in fact, he can be more specific to us than the prophet in conference ever can. The prophet's message is crafted specifically to apply across the board in a very general sense. But if you, if you went to college, you know you were probably in some massive classes where the professor, you know, there's 300 people in the class, and then you have maybe smaller breakout groups with a TA or something like that. I had this a couple of classes in my, when I was in college. And the professor will make these grand statements, these, these great, you know, these big teaching um, uh, statements, and he'll say, this is, you know, this is what it is, right? This is how everything's going to go. But then in the individual sessions, and then even if you would go in for office hours, he or she would clarify, right? So yes, this is the general statement, but for you, I want to explain it a little bit different. This is what it means. Or for you, you're in a different spot. Maybe you, you, you're not quite to the point where you understand what I said. I'm going to back it up a bit, and this is going to be your thing. doesn't make the general statement any less true, but it makes your statement for you that much more poignant. Because if you, if the professor were to tell you, okay, I know I said that to the class, but I want you to focus on this thing, and you didn't do that, then you wouldn't actually be progressing. You wouldn't actually be doing what, what the professor wanted you to do. You'd be thinking, oh, well, you said, you know, in this general session that you wanted us to do this, and so I'm going to do that, right? The problem is the professor has a very specific thing for you. And if you don't believe, to, to bring the metaphor back to, the, to what we're really talking about here, if you don't believe that God has a plan for you, if you don't believe that he can speak it to you, that he can tell you what it is, and you don't believe that it's possible if you are, are unwilling to accept the possibility 
that what God has in plan in, in store for you, or what He would like for you, or what He you know what He plans on for you, is different than what He plans for somebody else. Then you are delusional, delusional, and there's no difference between you and cult members, people, FLDS Church, Scientology, all these different things. There's no difference because you refuse to make that in that personal connection to get what's what's good for you. And so we sit and we just churn through this whole society, this whole culture of the religion, and we show up and we do the things that we're supposed to do, and we go through the motions, and we never actually get any closer. As a society, as a group of Christians, we never actually get closer to realizing what it even means to be a Christian because we're so stuck in the rut of general statements and appearing to be what we think we're supposed to be, as opposed to becoming what we need to be. And it's all based on fear. We're afraid that if we step outside the lines, we're going to be shunned. We're afraid that if we, if we, you know, if we break with tradition, we're going to be, number one, we're afraid we're going to be perceived as, as a wicked or apostate, which no matter how much you're protesting is the biggest fear for you. The biggest fear is that someone's going to think you're apostate. Who cares what they think? And number two, we're afraid that we're actually going to be wrong. Like that we're going to, we're going to receive some revelation or something, and it's going to be the wrong thing. And so we're going to have to, you know, we're going to make a mistake. I have, I have two things to say. Number one, they thought Christ was an apostate. Okay because of the way that he lived, the principles that he himself instigated, right? The law of Moses was put in place by Christ himself in the Old Testament. I mean, obviously I'm I'm within a certain uh, belief structure. It was put in place by him and he showed up and he knew what the principles meant. But yet the people of the day, the the priests, the the authority figures of 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 the church at that time, thought he was an apostate because of what he was teaching. And yet he was teaching the most true and pure truths of Judaism. Which comes back to, you know, be a good person. Treat other people right. right? Lift up the, you know, the, the people that need to be lifted up. And yet all of those people at that time thought that he was like the worst thing. So much so that they had him executed. Now, they, didn't, they weren't evil people. Right? They had just been so, they'd allowed themselves to get so indoctrinated in, this, in the culture, in the hedge around the law, so to speak, that they, they were blind to the truth when it was spoken to them. Because it shattered their, that, you know, that image of this is what it is. And I think in general, people, are, we're just really, we really like order and structure and for someone else to come in and tell us what to do. No matter how, no matter how much you think that you're you know, like, a, oh, I, I don't like authority and all this stuff. We, we, we really are drawn and grab, we gravitate towards people who are confident and tell us what to do. And so we just let our own, or let our own uh, introspection and our own consideration of different thoughts and, and things just go to the wayside because we have somebody that we think we can trust more. There's also, I mean, there's no difference between, you know, we talk a lot in primary about not, about not you can't you can't survive on the testimony of someone else. You can't survive on the testimony of the prophet. Think about that. You can't survive on the testimony of the people that speak in conference. You can only survive, and I mean this in the Mormon sense, on your own testimony, yours. Which means you have to work on it, which means you have to have a personal relationship with God where somebody gets up in conference and maybe says something. There's nothing that says you can't already have understood that and had that conversation with God yourself. If you really believed that God can speak to you, there would be no limits. All the messages that are coming from from conference would be right in line with the messages that you're already getting because it's the same guy, right? That's the whole point. It's the same guy giving the message. Whether he gives it to you or gives it to somebody else, it's the same exact message. So we shouldn't be afraid if we believe and we have a relationship with God. It's like it says in Psalms, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. 
I will not be afraid of evil. I won't be afraid of being what may seem to be evil or at least apostate or, or bad because I trust God more than I trust anybody else. And that's a personal decision that you have to make. Do you trust God more than you trust the prophet? I remember the first time I started thinking about this, my mind was just exploding because this is so against the way that we're brought up. It's just, not against, I shouldn't say. It's actually totally in line, but in our own minds, the first thought, the first reaction is, whoa, no, that's apostate. That's bad. You're going places, dude. Like, you need to not do that. But the truth is, the more you go there and you have individual spiritual experiences, those experiences where you become closer to God yourself, you start to lose that fear. And it's no longer, oh, I got to go to church and I have to say what everyone else says. I have to, I have to, I have to parrot back the right answer so that people don't think that I'm apostate. No. You become you. You become what you're supposed to be. And you start to, to understand and, and get that direct connection with, with, who, with who God is and what he wants for you. I mean, Christ himself said, not all who say, Lord, Lord, will get into the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of the Father. Which means, as I take it, you can't just thump your chest, say, I believe, and you're, and you're good. You, in order to know the will of the Father, you have to have a relationship with him. Right? So if, if, the, if, the, if the end goal is you know, eternal salvation and the way you get it is through knowing the Father, doing the will of the Father, you have to actually put effort into that, not just into following what somebody else does. Right? Because this isn't a group thing. It's not like overall, as long as you know, we're all at like a 75% collectively, then we all get in. No. This is a one-on-one -on -one thing. This is you and God. This is me and God. It has nothing to do with you guys. This whole, this whole journey, this whole process is between me and God. And it's between you and God. And everything else that, comes, that happens in my life has to come back to that same spot. Boom, boom. And what the prophet says from the pulpit, I respect. I have an immense amount of respect for the leaders of the church. And I do give deference to them over other people, <laughs> over most other people. But I do not give deference to the prophet over my own re revelations with God. It doesn't make any sense. It, it, that negates my faith. It negates the need for my faith in God, for my connection with God. Because if, if it's true that the prophet cannot, is not capable of making a mistake, then there's no need for me to have any faith. All I have to do is obey. But that's not the point. First of all, because there's no way for us to know if the, if the prophet is leading us astray, except to ask. Interesting, isn't it? The second thing, so that was, that was uh, a whole little rant about... Um, about seeming to be apostate when you when you have these things. The other thing is actually being wrong. Um, a lot of times we're afraid. I know this is totally me, by the way. All this stuff I'm explaining is me. This I'm I'm laying it out for you. I'm afraid that if I veer from what it seems like everyone's accepting the prophets to be saying, that I'm actually wrong. Right, and so I'm. I'm actually incorrect, which means I'm falling away. But that, again, goes back to the fear aspect, which is, which, if I had faith, then I wouldn't be afraid of being wrong. I would be maybe afraid, I might make mistakes, but there's no need to be afraid of making mistakes. That's what life is, is making mistakes and then improving and getting better. But again, it comes back to, for me, it comes back to the, the faith and the belief that, number one, God's there, Number two, he speaks to us. And number three, he can speak to you. I believe he can speak to me directly. Not, he doesn't have to go through the scriptures. He doesn't have to go through the prophet. doesn't have to go through a song. doesn't have to come through a walk on the beach. He can speak directly to me. And I trust that more than anything else in the world. More than anything else in the world. And the problem is... I don't think, judging from my own experience, I don't think that many of us do that. I think that most of us are still, and even after watching this video, I know that a certain percentage of you are going to be like, yeah, he's right. We've got to be more focused on our own spiritual connections with God. But 
but I, the prophet is right. I got to follow the prophet. I got to do what the prophet says. And you, you're missing a point if you do that. The point is not to disobey the prophet. The point is not to stop doing what you've been doing your whole life. The point is to start doing it for the right reasons. The point is to become the person that does those things naturally. The point is to have a relationship and to get a direct confirmation from the source of all the things that we're talking about. Because if you don't, I mean, if you don't have that confirmation, if you don't connect with the actual source, it's easy to be led astray. And even if the people that could lead us astray won't, the point is they could lead us astray, which means we are on sandy, weak foundation. If our foundation is anything but God and Christ for Christians, but God for religious people, it's not on a sure foundation because anybody else can make mistakes and does make mistakes all the time. So what I would plead with you to do is, uh, well, what I would plead with you to do is to join me in the, the effort and the energy of creating an individual relationship and conduit to the truth and to what you believe in and act only on what your sense of higher power, God, deity, whatever it is, says. Not based on what anybody else says. It's based on you and your connection. And sometimes that comes by way of logic. Sometimes that comes by way of introspection. Sometimes that comes by way of voices in your head. And guess what? The more you trust you and what's coming through you, the less you will be led astray when somebody else says something that's not true. You have to practice and you have to be connected to the source. Because if not, you just get whipped around. You just latched onto someone else's coattails. And it's all based on a fear of abandonment, a fear of being left out, a fear of not fitting in. Religion is not about fitting in. Religion is not about being righteous. All right? Religion is about improvement. It's about getting better. It's about connecting with something bigger. It's about faith. But it's not about blind obedience. I think that's it. If you stuck around this long, I applaud you. And I hope that you understood sort of what I was getting at, which is uh, we need to be more in tune with our own spirituality and not just follow along with what other people say. Um, yeah. Happy Sunday to you. Today church was good today. I had a, had a good, good church today, which was awesome, which kind of fueled a lot of this. Um, so anyway, that's it.